help me to deliver this truth to them uh, in a way that uh, it would truly be the blessing that you you uh, desire and plan for it to be. Lord, help me, I pray, this uh, afternoon as we record this. And Lord, I pray uh, that you bless our church as we look to you in these days. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Luke chapter number 6, I'll read beginning in verse number 12 for you today, and we'll jump right into the message this morning. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that he, speaking of Jesus, went out into a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Simon, who, he, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which, was all, uh, which also was the traitor. In the life of a disciple, everything is secondary to following Jesus. If we were talking to, to each other today and I asked you, what are you? I wonder what you would say. A lot of us would probably knee-jerk in a question like that to responding with a reference to maybe the job that we have. A lot of us find identity in our job. And so maybe if I asked you, what are you? You might say, well, I'm a construction worker. I'm a contractor. I'm an accountant, maybe, or a plumber, or an electrician, an engineer, or a secretary. And, and obviously the list goes on and on and on in regards to what you could do as a job. And so maybe you'd say, well, this is what I am. But maybe then I, I listen to your answer to that and I say, but, but what are you? You might pause for a second wondering where I'm going with this line of reasoning and then you may, you may respond with some reference to maybe your family. You might say, well, I, I'm a husband if you're a, a man and you're married or you might say, I'm a wife if you're a, a woman and you're married or you may then say if you have children, you may say, I'm a father or a mother, or if you, uh, and you are obviously a child, you may say, well, I'm a son, or I'm a daughter, or I'm a grandma, I'm a grandpa, I, 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 and you may say something in regards to your family connections. But then I listen to your answer then, and what if then I asked you, but what are you? And from there, you may go on to try to really dig a little deeper and say, well, I, I guess I'm, you know, in regards to maybe a social sphere, you may say, well, I, I'm a friend, I, I'm, I'm a neighbor, I, I'm an American, or maybe you have some uh, other cultural or country background or a different ethnic background, maybe that at that moment you would feel, uh, just say, hey, I, you know, this is also what I am. And I listen to your answers there, and then I ask you again, but what are you? And then maybe you would reference some personal aspect about you in particular that's maybe very, very unique to you. Maybe you'd mention uh, maybe a hobby, something that you like to do. You might say, well, I'm a golfer, uh, I'm a woodworker, uh, uh, I, I'm a I'm a." A reader, I'm a sports fan, maybe you're a Vols fan, maybe uh, you're a fan of some other uh, sport team, or maybe just one particular sport or something, uh, or, or, or some other aspect about you that's very, very individual to you, and I listen to your answer there, and then I look at you again, and I say, but what are you? And then maybe you'd say, and, and obviously the order of these could be completely different. I'm just, this is just how I uh, broke it down as I thought about break, uh, introducing this thought for you today. And, and then maybe you'd say, well, I'm a Baptist. That's what I am. Or I, I, I'm a Baptist. Or maybe uh, for, for some listening today, you may identify with some other, uh, some other aspect of, uh, of a religion or, or something in and, and, and whatever a case that may be. And you may reference your, your religious background. Or you may just say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian and, and we're getting close to what I would be trying to draw out of you in this line of questioning. And, but then after you mention your religious affiliation, 
What if I still then, after all of this, asked you, but what are you? And then maybe finally you just look at me and say, well, what do you want me to say? I've told you so much already about what I am, what I might identify with. And at the very center of what you are, you are a disciple. Now, you might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, there's a lot that I mean by that. And that's what this entire lesson is all about. The title of this lesson, if I've not already said it, is I Am a Disciple. And in particular, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I have a lot more to say about this as we go. But that's what I would want, and that's what I believe God wants all of us at the very base level. If you if you if you call out all the other things that you may identify with in your life, you you draw you just draw it all out because sometimes we think, oh well, I'm a I I work in this profession, and and my identity is I'm a I'm I'm an accountant, or I'm I'm an engineer, or I work at Eastman, or I work at some other factory or some factory or some uh, organization, but one day that's going to be gone. One day you'll retire, or maybe one day uh, even, I know for many during a season like we've been going through, maybe you'll even lose your job or, or, or something that will change what you are in that area. But if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you should in your mind be able to just get everything out else out of the way and bring it down to this one base level. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what we are. And, I, and I'll... I'll talk to you today briefly about just what leads to that. And there's a lot that that we have to look at this morning, and I'm just going to give you some things today. But as I think about that, and I think about what we read just a moment ago, there's something that that comes to mind And as we look at this, because as I see this 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 uh, text, and as I see what's contained in here, uh, while I have one title uh, that I've given to you, there's a, there's a subtitle, if I can uh, put it that way, of this. And, and the subtitle of this message today is The Biblical Picture of a Disciple. Art criticism has been a uh, part of various cultures for centuries, and, and today it's actually gotten down to a very clear-cut process in, uh, in some of the phases that it goes through. And, and uh, you can go to different cultures throughout history and you can find the appreciation of art, whether that's uh, sculptures or paintings or uh, other things made by hands, whether it's buildings and, and edifices and whatever uh, else it may be. But just today, just I want you to have in your mind the, the, the picture of a picture. Uh, art criticism as it is focused on a painting or a drawing or maybe even a picture taken by a camera, but in particular, I want you to think about that which would be painted. And suppose uh, today I brought a picture up here, and it was a picture just of a, a beautiful mountain scene. We would all, for a moment, probably admire that painting, uh, and uh, then probably from that point, we would just go on with our life. We, uh, none of us, uh, probably watching today, are experts in the realm of art criticism, and so we say, "Hey, yeah, that's nice," and and uh, and then you know, okay, now what? But if I took that same beautiful masterpiece and I sat it in front of a group of art critics, they would, they, they, they would have a process that they would go through. And, and there's four per different steps that they would follow. And there's, there, there would obviously be a lot of particulars to this that I wouldn't even understand. But as I looked into this uh, for this, this particular message, this is some things I uh, was able to draw out. And those four uh, steps would be the first one being description. 
but they would look at the elements that make up the picture. They just look at it and they would describe it. Hey, this is, I already described it a little bit to you, a beautiful mountain scene. A picture of mountains, maybe like it was this morning uh, as I was uh, driving into Johnson City this morning. The, the, I could see the, the mountains in the distance and uh, still some fog kind of caught on some of the, uh, the mountains way up high. And you could maybe envision something like that for this picture. That would be the description. There's fog, there's mountains, there's trees, there's, uh, you know, there's some sky, you know, and all the, the colors that would go into that. But then they would go into the phase called analysis. They would make, a de- in this phase is the making of determinations as to why the painter used what they did and what the elements of the painting themselves uh, suggest. And so this was going deeper than just what the picture is of, but what it is made of. Why did he use that paint? Why did he use that frame if it's framed? Why, why is it that this painter decided to uh, pick and draw out those particular things and, and use those particular elements to uh, emphasize the, uh, the, the aspects of the picture that he wanted emphasized? Why, why did he use the paper that he used? All of that would come into play in the analysis, and then they would move on to interpretation. And this would be making determinations about what the painter meant by the picture. With all of the backdrop, the description, the analysis in mind, they can say, what was he trying to convey? What was the message? What, what the interpretation of it? And then evaluation, comparing this picture to similar works to see where it stands. And, and this, is, this is where individual points of, uh, of quality would make it stand out or fade away. But in all of this, I have one picture primarily in mind. And that's the picture that the Bible provides for us today. And the picture the Bible provides for us today to look at is not a picture of mountains or a cottage somewhere set in the woods, not a, not a river, not a cityscape, nothing of the sort. The picture the Bible has for us today is, though, by a master painter. It's a painter that uh, has qualities that are important. The materials that are used in the picture that we're looking at today suggest a great deal about uh, the, the God that painted the picture, the master behind the masterpiece and and it has a and it says a lot is that all of those things are combined together the meaning itself is significant and and so as we look at this picture we see the picture is of a disciple what does that look like what does that entail what's it made up of what does it mean And I'll just go on to say this, the evaluation of a biblical disciple, there's nothing that exceeds it in this life. Not to say the disciples are the greatest people, but that what God does in the lives of of His disciples is the greatest thing that we can focus on. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it today. You see, in this passage of Scripture, we find God beginning to show us some things about, uh, about discipleship. And the fact is, as I said this, uh, this morning as a, in this recording, what we find is that everyone is a disciple. Every person can make the statement, I am a disciple. But you may not mean by that what I mean when I say that, because you can make anything your master. You see, a disciple is one who follows the, 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 the principles uh, of another or follows principles in general as master or follows someone else uh, in what they have been teaching. And so uh, you are a follower if you're a disciple. And so some people make success their master and they follow their opportunity, their opportunities. Others make money their master and they follow the dollar sign. And some make self their master and they follow their desires. But if you make Jesus your, your master, you'll follow His teaching. So all, you're a disciple of something. Becoming a disciple and walking as a disciple of Jesus Christ is about one primary thing. Following Jesus. That's it. It, it, In reality, if we stopped there and you took the time to think through 
all of what that means, then you would probably come out with some great benefit. But uh, since I know uh, you tuned in, not for me just to give you uh, some food for thought in the sense of giving you uh, a task to think through. I've tried to think through some of these things, biblically speaking, to show you the biblical portrait of a disciple. And so we're going to look at four components of this picture so we can help, so I can help you understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ today. And so the first component of this picture we're going to look at this morning is we're going to look at the picking for discipleship. Jesus in this passage of Scripture calls out His disciples in a very, very specific way, in a very, very precious moment. But what I want to tell you before we really get to this moment is that Jesus' choosing of these disciples for uh, the work, that it, for, for all that He had desired for them was actually a progressive thing. It, it was not something that just in that moment they... they uh, uh, that, that, that Jesus just kind of randomly or haphazardly chose them out. There was a, a progression that led to this point. And as a matter of fact, the first about year and a half of Jesus' ministry was uh, spent with Jesus by and large traveling alone. He uh, would have introduced himself and, be, himself and become uh, acquainted with some of the disciples in this period, if not all of the disciples in that period of time. But that was prior to Luke chapter 6, verse number 12, that we read this morning. And, and so what happened in that year and a half is they began to hear about this teacher, about Jesus Christ. And the first stage in the progression of a disciple is their conversion. A disciple must first come to the point where they accept the message of the, the one that they're going to follow. And since the context of this today is being a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I would say this, Jesus is the only person, the only principle, the, 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 the one who gives principles that we should follow. The only one worthy of following. And so their conversion was the beginning point. And at, at some point along the way, in that first year and a half of Jesus' ministry, Jesus became, a, uh, sorry, not Jesus, but these men uh, came to accept Jesus Christ's message as being the Messiah, uh, all except for Judas Iscariot, the one who was uh, to become the traitor, and we won't get into that uh, today. But they had to accept the message that Jesus had come to this earth to be the Messiah. The Bible says that He is the truth, that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And, and while their understanding would grow in time, they accepted the basic premise of His message. We learned some of that from John chapter number 1 and 2, and we learned some other places as well. Uh, some of the moments where Jesus first introduced Himself to some of these disciples was uh, these moments were times of uh, th them coming to understand a little bit more, but uh, even in those first acquaintance meetings, they did not begin to follow Him uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as they would come to. So, first of all, was their conviction Version. And I would remind you today, you will never be a disciple of Jesus Christ until you accept Jesus Christ personally into your life. There was their conversion, but then there was their calling. And that's what we read about this morning. Their, their calling was a call to uh, come and to follow Christ. And, and Jesus chooses them out in a very uh, special way for a very special task. Jesus called them out. And I want to tell you this today. Jesus has a call for your life as well. No matter what it is that, uh, that, that you may actually be doing uh, or called to do, and I want to remind you that God has a calling for you. God has something specific uh, for your life. There was their conversion and their call and then their commission. He called them to Himself and then He sent them out from himself, and this is uh, the, these two things are are caught up in the words that are used in verse number thirteen. Again, the Bible says, "And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Disciples are those who follow the master. Apostles are those who are sent to do the bidding of the master." 
And so these men in this passage are known as disciples and apostles. They, they, their call to follow, their commission to go. But as we look at this moment this morning in this picture, I want you to notice again what it says in verse number 12. You see, verse number 12 says something that is absolutely powerful to remember. It says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued there all night in prayer to God. See, their call, their, their, their picking for discipleship was progressive, but it was also prayerful. Not their prayers, but God's, Jesus' prayers for them. And this emphasizes the fact that this was that this calling, this work, that this this this, at, this life of discipleship was not something that was uh, primarily just a physical thing. It was not just some uh, things that they were to do, but there was a spiritual aspect that was so important. You see, if this had primarily been a physical thing that Jesus was preparing them for, he probably wouldn't have spent all night in prayer. He may have spent all night uh, preparing notes for his lessons or or putting together packing lists for their journeys or plotting the course that they would take or writing the job description of each one of the disciples or putting a calendar together for the next 18 or so months that he would have to train them or maybe uh, performing interviews of their families to find out more about them and studying each one of their professions so he would know how to relate to and minister to them. But all of those things were not the focus. His focus was spiritual. He was prayerful in his choosing. He was much in prayer. All night long in prayer about this that he was about to embark on this new phase in his earthly ministry and this new phase definitely in their lives. And, and I, I say this to say that discipleship is not something that we should take lightly. If Jesus spent all night in prayer to, uh, with, with, in fellowship with the Father before He called out the twelve that would follow Him from day to day, uh, I want to remind you that you and I should approach this same walk in a very, very prayerful way as well. And then we notice the people that are part of this picture. And, uh, and I, just because of the time that we uh, want to make sure that we, we keep this all under, uh, I don't want to spend too much time here, but each one of the men that are mentioned here are very, very different men. Jesus did something in calling out the disciples that is absolutely profound. You see, uh, Simon Peter was a fisherman who was passionate and bold to a fall. Andrew was uh, all likewise a fisherman. He was the one that introduced Peter uh, to Jesus and was often found bringing people to Jesus. James and John were fishermen uh, from the, the area of Galilee as well, who, who Jesus nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. And at one point in their lives, uh, they wanted to connect Condemn so harshly those that rejected Christ that they wanted to call fire down from heaven to consume an entire city of people. Philip was an earnest inquirer. Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel, uh, was, was a person that Jesus said there was no guile found in that man. Thomas was a melancholic and a twin. He was slow to believe and quick to express doubt. And, and uh, so th- these are different men. Matthew was a publican. Uh, James the less we don't even know anything about him basically and then Simon Zealotes the zealots were a, a, a group of people who spent their their entire lives they were revolutionaries they were trying to overthrow the Roman uh, usurpation of their their authority and their land and so uh, at times they would gather around Roman soldiers in crowds and they would all draw knives and all at one time plunge their knives into the uh, body of this Roman soldier and then just disband just as quietly into the crowds and that was one one of Jesus' disciples and Judas, the brother of James, who we also know very little about. And those two men remind us something that being a disciple is not about what, uh, not as much about your background, not about what you do, it's about who you follow. And Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Christ, and, and just kind of the 
the one that there's a lot of lessons that, that we find wrapped up in here, but all these men had different backgrounds. And it's amazing to see Jesus bring all of these men together in this, in this picture, each one of them a facet of the picture, but each one of them a picture in miniature uh, that we can study and we can learn so much about. But, but it's encouraging to see what Jesus did with such a group of unlikely candidates. I, I mean, these were, these were simple men, men Men that were that, that were from an area that was often looked down upon, but Jesus called these men to follow them. And while before Jesus call, each one of these men would have said, "Well, I'm a bean counter. I, I'm a publican. I, I, I'm a fisherman." Afterwards, they would say, "I'm a disciple." But what does that really mean? You see, we can see these men and understand maybe some just examples just kind of floating in the, uh, in the background, but what does it really mean to be a disciple? What we want to do is look at this next component of the picture to answer that question. And this is it simply. The priority of discipleship answers the question about what it means to be a disciple. Mark chapter number 3 uh, gives us another, um, uh, another look at this moment. And when Jesus came down from the mountain, the Bible says in Mark chapter number 3 that, that He ordained 12 that they might be with Him. This thought is also encapsulated in the phrase that we're very familiar with when Jesus would call someone to be with Him. He would say, follow Me. See, the priority of discipleship is not what we are doing. It's who we're with. It's about a relationship. To be with Him. You see, a lot of people would think, oh, Somebody important has called on my name. They must want me to do something for them. But that's not really what Jesus' first focus was. That they might be with Him. That He might walk with them. That He might spend time with them. And I want to remind you about this. Discipleship always involves relationship. Here at Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church, it is our desire to uh, be a disciple-making church. And I want to remind you, if we're going to make disciples, there's something we need to learn from Jesus in this moment. And that is, we must have relationships with people that we can bring them along and we can help them in their own walk with Christ as well. And Jesus brought them along with him. His first course of study for the disciples was not how to preach, was not even necessarily how to pray. His first course of study was simply observation. Hey, come, Peter, and follow me. Walk with me. The priority is spending time with Christ. Your level of intimacy with Christ determines your level of impact for Him. The most important decision you can make in regards to being a disciple is to step up and to walk with Christ intimately, regularly, all the time. That's what these men were to do. And the great impact of their lives stems out of the fact that these men were men who had a priority that was at the very front and that was, I just need to stay with Him. I just need to walk with Him. Uh, He may not tell me everything right up front, but as long as I stick by His side, uh, I I, I will make it where I need to go. And that's what you as a disciple need to keep in mind as well. Just be with Him. You may not always have the answers to why your life has taken that turn or why that event has happened, but I'll tell you this, God has the answer. And if you stay with Him long enough, you will come to some aspect of an understanding of what God desires. And He may not give you the answer, but He'll help you to accept that which He does give. And so just stay with Him. Focus on being a disciple. Not doing what a disciple does. You see, we are called human beings. Not human doings. A disciple is called to be with Him. That's the priority 
of discipleship. And then the next part of this picture that we see today is the perfecting that happens by discipleship. When Christ first called these 12 men, they were certainly an imperfect group of people. Can you imagine a publican and a zealot together in one small group of people who say, why, why would that be a big deal? Well, a publican had sold himself as a, as a contracted tax collector to the Roman Empire. They, their job was to collect taxes and they were to turn over a set amount of money to the Roman government and anything that they had over that amount, they got to keep. And so they would extort people. They would say, you owe this much, they may say, "Hey, you owe uh, you owe, owe the Roman government uh, to you know just for our uh, uh, for our understanding and make it simple. You owe the Roman government two hundred and fifty dollars when really they only owed them two hundred or one hundred and fifty. And that publican, would, under the legalities of the Roman Empire, had every right to do that and to keep it. That was that he was a Jew that had done that, sold himself to take money from his countrymen and keep some of it for himself and give some of it to the, the, the oppressors over them. And then there was the zealot, the guy who hated every aspect of Roman culture and Roman oppression, definitely the publicans. And each one of those guys was in this group. And by the end of it, this group of men turned the world upside down. In, in unity, the Bible said often in the beginning of the book of Acts that these men were all with one accord. They were together. They were unified in heart. Peter, who was the loud mouth throughout Jesus Christ's ministry, was also the loudest mouth on Pente the day of Pentecost uh, when he stood up and preached and 3,000 people were saved. John, one of the sons of thunder who at one point in his life thought it was uh, right and righteous to call down fire from heaven to consume a city of people who had rejected to Jesus Christ ends his life known as the disciple of, or the apostle, sorry, of love. How, how does that happen? Because God takes his disciples and changes them, perfecting. All throughout your life, God has one great desire through spending time with you. And that is to change you into who He desires for you to be. Into the image, to be conformed into the image of Christ is one way the Bible refers to it. The Bible says that, that pastors and teachers were given to the church for the perfecting of the saints. Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. All the Christian life is meant to be a continual progress from what we were to what God intends for us to be. John Newton once said, I am not what I was and I am not what I hope to be in, a, in another world. But by the great, there's some other things that he said all throughout that, but the ultimate thought that he was saying was, hey, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But by the grace of God, I am not what I once was and I am what I am. He was saying, hey, I, I used to be a horrible person and I'm not really all that much better right now and I know one day it's going to be really, really good when I get to heaven, but I am so thankful that as I go throughout this life, God is changing me. Perfecting by discipleship. You might say, hey, I have these struggles. Can I just encourage you with something? I have my own as well. And I can't get them all situated between now and next Friday. I'm not going to get it all worked out. Some of my struggles are really regular. I just, the same thing, I just kind of keep coming back up and hitting my head against it and just trying to work through it. But if you just keep going, not in your own strength, but in the strength that Christ provides, He will perfect you. 
That's his desire. That's his plan. That's part of the picture that we see in this passage just at the very beginning. And then the very last part of this picture, just very briefly, as this brings us right to the end of what I wanted to share with you today, is the fact that there is the passing of discipleship. You see, in Mark chapter number 3, I stopped. You see, Jesus said that he ordained 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. See, today, if you walked up to somebody and said, hey, I'm a disciple, they might look at you like you're weird. Because we don't use that word very often. And I said at the beginning, you might thought, well, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. A disciple really simply is just a learner or a pupil or a follower of the teachings of another, an apprentice. It's, they're somebody that learns by use and by practice and by watching. That's what a disciple of Jesus is. They watch Him and they allow that to be worked out in their own life. And we've, we've talked about that already, but the passing of discipleship hinges on the preaching of the disciples. You see, Jesus wanted these men to get it and to give it. You see, a, a, a lake like the Dead Sea that only takes water in and lets no water out will be known as a, a stagnant, a dead place. And that's exactly why the Dead Sea has so much sediment and so much, uh, it's just nothing lives there because it doesn't let anything out. And in your life, if you only ever just take it in and you never let it out, you're not really going to accomplish all that God desires. You're not going to grow in the way that God desires for you to grow. Jesus wanted them, as He said in Matthew chapter 4.19, follow Me and I will make you fishers of men. At the very, this is the theme all throughout Christ's ministry. Preparing them to spread the message. And at the very end of His ministry, a very famous passage of Scripture. We call it the Great Commission. This is what he says. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And that's what I want to focus on as we come to the end of this. The passing of discipleship from that day all the way to this day and in every day in the future. See, that phrase go and teach all nations means go and make disciples. And we know that the early church took this command very seriously. They, they referred to themselves as disciples again and again and again. All throughout the book of Acts, they were called disciples. They were called again in Acts chapter number 1, verse number 15, and chapter 6, verse number 1, and verse number 2 of chapter 6, verse number 7 of chapter 6, and Acts 9, verse number 1, and Acts 9, verse 25, and uh, in Acts uh, 11, verse 26, it says, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And I love that passage because I remind you that the life of a disciple is about mimicking his master. And in that place, in, the book, in, in Antioch, they were called Christians, which means little Christs. I think they must have been doing a good job imitating their master. They followed him. They learned from him. And they put it into practice. But the people in Antioch were not just the twelve. These were the hundreds and hundreds that had been saved through the ministry of the apostles that had spread all throughout that region. And so the passing of discipleship is from one disciple to someone else who then becomes a disciple all throughout history, throughout all ages. That is God's plan. And the people of the first century got the picture. But will the people of the 21st century get the picture? See, the picture is actually not just seen here. It's seen here. And so I ask you today, are you a disciple? Because part of being a disciple is accepting the call, no doubt. Following the path, that priority of walking with Christ. Allowing that to change us and spreading it to everyone we possibly can. That's what, is, that's, that's what a disciple is. It's so simple. And so don't stop short. It's wonderful to, to glean and to learn and to listen to Sunday school times and all of these things. But there's something far more wonderful. And that is completing the picture. And so I ask you today, what are you? 
Are you a disciple? I ask you more specifically, are you his disciple? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day you've given to us today. Thank you for this truth about discipleship. Lord, I, I want to be a good disciple. And I know that so many times I, I fall short of that. And Lord, this has been a unique time for all of us, but there's something that we can focus on, and that is being with you. Right now, we may have more time, and I know some things are beginning to reopen, and life is getting back to normal, and I pray that as it does, we wouldn't lose focus on the priority of being with you, but as we get and are able to go back out, help us also to remember the action that we're supposed to have in our lives is to pass it on. The only action verb in, the, uh, in that whole passage is to make disciples. And so, Lord, I pray that we would make disciples, that we would be disciples, because the only way to make a disciple is first by being one. So help us to walk with you and to do the work you'd have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.